uh, have been in a series called Experiencing God. We, we're, we're not done with it yet, but it's a, it's a workbook that really uh, operates on some basic realities. Reality number one is that God is always at work around us. God is working around us. And it's pretty evident if you spend any time looking at even our local area here and even within our church that God is working in some pretty special ways. But the reality number two is that God is pursuing a love relationship with each and every one of us that is real and personal. That God himself as he's at work, is drawing us to himself. The Bible says no one comes to the Father lest they be drawn. So you are not here by accident today. I believe that God is at work and that you're here because he wants to speak to you and he has something for you. But God also invites us to join him in his work. In other words, it's not like, hey, I'm here, God, these are what, this is my list of things that I can do, and therefore I need you to bless me and put me in one of those roles. No, it's the exact opposite. God is at work, he's inviting us in to something that he wants to do that is apart from our will, it's more his will. Can I get an amen on that? It's important. And then how he does it, he speaks to us, he speaks to us through his word, through the Holy Spirit, through the church, and through life's circumstances. I mean, sometimes the voice of God through life's circumstances can be pretty loud, if you get what I mean. Sometimes what we do, how we navigate life, some of the decisions that we've made, perhaps even outside of God's will, speak clearly to us about who he is and his purposes for our lives. So this week, we're going to talk about crisis of belief. And crisis of belief is something universal for each and every one of us in here. You may not believe so, but I hope that by the end of today's message, you will understand that. When we think about crisis, though, there's all kinds of ideas that come into mind. But in the Greek, the word crisis really means turning point or a decision to make. It means there's a turning point in our lives, a decision to make, in order to uh, respond to God. So it's, there's a crisis, a turning point, and then the belief side is this faith that we've got to take hold of in order to turn and walk with God as he invites us into his plan. And I would say there's very few biblical examples of this that are, that are greater than Moses and his journey with God. So if you have your Bibles, I would love for you to open them up to Exodus chapter 3, uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time in here. We're going to start in verse 7. Um, but let's, let's listen to what the Word of God says. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the land of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, uh, Hivites, Jebusites, Termites. We can go on and on with the ites, right? You get it. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go... I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Can you imagine what Moses is processing at this point? Hey, first of all, Moses had a history, years, where he lived in Egypt. He understand Egypt's culture. He understand their power, their ability to do many, many things. They're standing within the world context at that time. And he also understood and remembered how he left Egypt. You guys remember that? Running with the tail between his legs because he had murdered someone. And now God appears to him and says, therefore, go. Sounds familiar. He's sending Moses back to Pharaoh. God speaks and invites Moses into God's plan. This would have never been on Moses' radar. This would not have been Moses' plan. 
And, and I would say that when God invites us into something, his invitation provokes us and even demands us to respond. God provokes us. You see, we serve a God who is very dynamic. He is alive and active. He's always moving. The train of God is on the move. And, and our job is to join God as he's moving and get on his train and his schedule. So this had nothing to do with what Moses wanted. This was God stepping again into Moses' mundane routine and saying, whoosh, 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 we're going to go do something, Moses. Pretty profound when you think about it. But God invited Moses. But here's what we have to understand. God didn't invite Moses in just to bring what he had. God invited him in and required a change in Moses. And this is important for each of us because as we respond to God, God wants to do stuff in us and through us. Well, the in us part is always change, right? It's always change. It's always taking us and refining us and reshaping us. It's like what Jeremy was saying with Jeremiah and the potter and the clay. God wants to change us because we're not going on mission with God to say, bless what I want to do, right? So therefore, we need to change. Let's continue to follow along with, with Moses now. This is in verse 10 again, but I want to add 11 to it. So here's what God says. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Where is Moses' perspective? I, me, right? Moses is not looking at God and the possibilities and the opportunities that God can open. Moses is more introspective about himself saying, I can't do this. I know all about the Egyptians. There's no possible way. Look, when you face a crisis of belief, you're at a crossroads. You can either trust God and follow what God says because of your mileage with him or your journey with him, or you can turn and go back to what is comfortable, convenient, and easy. Do you remember what the Israelites said after they got out into the wilderness or they were leaving and Pharaoh's army's approaching them? And what do they say? We want to go back to Egypt, right? Our natural inclination is to want to take the path of least resistance. It was a turning point for Moses. And I don't know about you guys, but when we respond to God, when we have a crisis of belief, when God invites us into something that is way bigger than what any of us could do, and it doesn't have to be to go back to Egypt. It could be something very personal in each of our lives. We may be at a crux or a crossroads in making some super important decision that pushes us into this crisis of belief. But we always, I believe, learn about more about who God is and also about ourselves when we follow God. I was thinking about a, an example of this, just about how the pressure of a crisis, out of that comes learning and understanding and knowledge. And I don't know, have you guys ever watched the movie uh, Deepwater Horizons? Anybody seen that movie? It's, it's a really, really intense movie, but it's, a, it's done well. And it's about a real story about this oil rig that's in the Gulf of Mexico, owned by, British, by BP, and they have a leak and an explosion, and it's a super deep well that lasts for 87 days. People's lives are lost. It's intense. But here's what I want you to catch about this. In the midst of this, they, they had never, ever discovered how to cap a wellhead at the depth that this well was. They had no means to do it, and therefore, it spewed oil out for 87 days. It's the worst oil disaster that we have on record, okay? But here's what happened. Through that crisis, they developed something new that enabled them to cap the well that is now a technology that they use anytime they do any deep water drilling. So there was a crisis 
They had to respond. They were provoked to respond. There was no other way. The circumstances demanded them to embrace what they were dealing with. And through that process, they grew and they understood and became more aware of what they could do to be safer at it. And my point in this is that God, as he invites us in, wants to teach us more and more about himself. And when we experience God at that intimate level, when he speaks and we respond out of obedience, we begin to learn things that are so important for our maturity, our future, what God has mapped out for us. We have the opportunity to experience God when we step out to trust him. Yet, that's not always easy, is it? I was thinking about in my own life, like, I have a whole, whole, I got a Rolodex. What, what do you call it now today? Digital file. I, I have so many files of crisis of belief in my life. I was thinking about what is the one, perhaps, that has taught me um, a really profound lesson. And this was back in 2014. I was on staff in Post Falls. I was in my office. I was actually praying about this next season of my life in 2014. And I'm like, God, what? Show me what's going on here. Like, is there something that 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 I could do that you that you're doing that I'm not seeing? Like, help me understand it. It wasn't like I was disgruntled. It was just one of those times where I was praying. The phone rings. It's a executive job search company out of Colorado Springs, a headhunter. The guy's name is Rob, Rob Lauer. He calls me up and he says, Hey. Uh, we have a church in California that is looking for someone, and your name came up. And I'm like, Rob, I told God long ago I would never go back to California. And, and I'm not poking at California. I'm just saying, I told, don't tell God you will never. Because the phone rings, and now I'm in a crisis of belief. But not only me, but Christy, my wife as well. She's like, we're not going back to California. Guess what? We stepped out, as crazy as it seemed, and we went to California for four years. And here's what I'll tell you. I learned more about God and myself in those four years than I've learned in many others. Not because it was the only place I could go. It's because I responded to the call of God. I worked through my crisis of belief. I didn't see what was ahead of me. And yet it was an incredible journey. And it's important for us to realize that God is in the business of transforming us and changing us. And here's where we end up circumventing God so often. And I don't know if you've ever caught yourself doing it. Uh, wink, wink, you probably have. But we often think or say, show me God first and I'll trust you. You ever done that? I'm not going anywhere until I see where this is headed, right? Right? Versus God says, trust me, and I will show you. Do you see the difference there? One is, i got to see all the facts, because I process sequentially. I've got to get it all worked out in my mind. And then, who is the onus on in the trust? Is, is there faith on ourselves or on God on that? But when God says, trust me, and he invites us into this relationship, and he invites us to join him in his plan... And then says, I will show you, just as he did with Moses, what I want you to do. God is in the driver's seat with the steering wheel. We're not, right? We think we are, but we're not. And I would say that whether God is inviting you to join him in something big or something really small, it will challenge your faith. It will challenge your faith. God will challenge your faith. So the Point number two in your notes, if you're a note follower, is there is often spiritual wrestling in the midst of a crisis of belief. A spiritual wrestling. And I love the passage in Galatians 5. Paul does this picture where he talks about the flesh and the spirit and how they war against one another. Listen to what Paul says. 5, 16 and 17. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary or against the Spirit. And the Spirit 
what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. There is a battle. And I would define our flesh as things that are outside of God's spirit. Our flesh are things that we generate from our own will, not yielded to God. And Paul is saying that there is this battle that rages in every believer. And I think this is a picture of what happens when God invites us into something that's God-sized to take on in our lives, that we wrestle in our faith spiritually, and it's literally a spiritual event in our hearts and our minds between the Holy Spirit who resides in you if you're a believer and your flesh that you still struggle with day in, day out. our flesh will always lead us to doubt, to self-justification, to making excuses or looking for an easier path. You get that? Left to ourselves, we will take the easier path every time, won't we? But the Spirit will always point us to what is best, but not what is easiest, right? Right? It's not, it was not easy to sell my house in Cougar Gulch, leave my job in Post Falls with this church, and to fly down to California and learn a whole new culture, a whole new group of people, a whole new staff, the whole thing. It was crazy and terrifying at times. And yet God is good. He's really good. And I would say this, being a follower of Christ is not the easy path. How many of you guys have figured that out by now? A few of you guys. Did someone sell you a different story at one time? Oh, you just become a Christian and life is easy. Wrong. It's good. Here's what Luke 9 says. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. By obedience only. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. You know what the word deny means in the Greek? Say no. It's really simple. It's not this really fancy word. It's whoever says no to their flesh or themselves and takes up their cross daily and follows me, that's a follower of Christ. That's a disciple. He says in verse 24, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. Does this sound like the journey of a Christian is easy? That's pretty, that is a stiff command right there that Jesus has given us, right? Following Christ confronts our comfort. Are you comfortable? Everything's the way I want it. North Idaho, utopia, spring, we're going to be on the lake. Got my house, got all my toys, got all the stuff. Nothing wrong with any of those. Are you comfortable? Because that will get in the way of hearing the voice of God. And responding. It doesn't mean any of that stuff's bad. Don't, don't hear me. It just means that our comfort, our pride, our common sense, and even our logic are challenged when we step out to follow God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, I, verse 27, I love it because it fits perfectly in here. He says, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Do you, do you, can you imagine being Noah? And God says, I want you to build this ark. What do you think his neighbor said? You're crazy, dude. You, you went off the edge. Right? God chooses. You know, the word foolish in here is hilarious in the Greek. It's moroso. It's where we get the word morose or moron, or moronic. I mean, literally, that word is a crazy word to say that God uses the things that are like stupid in the world's eyes, that don't make sense, to confound the wise. So when God invites you to join him on his journey, and you have a crisis of belief, you are confronted with all kinds of things that are crazy, like that come out of the world, right? That we all wrestle with. Here's a few of them. I mentioned it briefly, but dying to comfort. Like, this is what I know. When you lean into discomfort, 
When you lean into being uncomfortable, you, and I don't mean fabricating uncomfort on stupid decisions. I'm talking about being uncomfortable because the voice of God is speaking in your life, okay? But when you lean into that, you get to experience the supernatural grace and power of God in ways that you would never experience if you're playing it safe. God isn't safe, by the way. He's good, but he's not safe, is he? What about doubt? It comes right out of Genesis 3. Did God really say that? Moses is like, God, you're telling me to go to Egypt. Are you even going to show up? I am convinced this is why God so often in the Bible tells us that he's going to be with us. I'm thinking about it. He tells Moses time and again. He tells Joshua, be strong and courageous, but remember, I'm going to be with you. You go all the way forward to Jesus and the Great Commission, and how does Jesus start and end the Great Commission? All power and authority has been given to me, therefore go into all the world and make disciples, right? Baptizing him in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching him to obey all I've commanded. Say that fast three times. But then what does he say? He says, lo, I will be with you until the end of the age. God is always promising when he calls us that he will be with us. And so he does that because the devil loves to float the the doubt card out. I couldn't possibly do this. What about fear? It's too hard, God. It's too hard. Again, if our eyes are on ourselves, it's always going to be too hard because we don't have it in us to do it. Even when God wants to change things in our lives that were maybe relationally based, what do we run up against every time? Our flesh, right? We need the Spirit of God to move in our lives. But the fear of man, people are going to laugh at me if I respond to God. People are going to laugh. Really? We did baptism for service. And I know a lot of people that wrestle with baptism because it requires humility. Here's 100% guarantee. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, a follower of Christ, God is calling you. You're not here by accident. God wants to change your life, transform you, free you from the bondage of sin. And if you've been a Christian in here and you've not been baptized and you've made all kinds of fear or doubt or whatever, I'm, don't, my life's not good enough to do it, God is saying to you, trust me, I'm with you. I will walk with you. Don't let fear, doubt, the fear of man, self-sufficiency, that's the one I'm always high-centering on. Yeah, I rely on God all the time, and yet I am a control freak at times. I, I take back. God, I got this. Don't worry. I I got an idea what you want to do. I'll take care of it. Self-sufficiency. Anyone in here? Any of these? All of them, right? Our responses are not much different than what Moses went through. Sometimes you read Exodus and you're laughing at Moses, but when you look in the mirror, it's like, oops. Here's Exodus 4, verse 1. Moses answered, what if they don't believe me or listen to me and say the Lord and, and say the Lord did not appear to you? What, what is Moses wrestling with right here? He's like, it's fear. What if? Doubt. Doubt. Like, in other words, he's saying they're gonna think I'm crazy. I'm gonna go to them and they're gonna laugh at me. Look at Exodus 4:10. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Where is his focus? I'm not good enough. It's not what God's asking us. God God is not asking us whether we're good enough, right? That's just not even a part of the plan. This this just cracks me up how often I do this. Exodus 4.13. But Moses said, oh, Lord, please send someone else. Anybody ever done that? There's someone more qualified than me. God speaks to you, and you look around the other way, and he must be talking to someone else, right? No, God is talking to you. He's talking to you. 
And here's the thing that hits me, is God does not call qualified people. Throughout the whole Bible, these aren't qualified people that he's calling. God qualifies the people that he calls. Let's get this right. You have not arrived. You, you don't entirely see what God sees. God wants to reveal it to you through humility, submission, and faith. But God is in the business of qualifying you through character development as you trust him, as he invites you into where he's going. It's important. I love what Blackaby says in our study guide for those of you that are going through it. God doesn't call you to get involved in his activity merely so that you can see what you can do. He calls you to assignment that you can't accomplish apart from his divine intervention. God's assignments have God-sized dimensions. What you thinking? Kind of backwards from the world, isn't it? It's another one of those inside-out deals. The world says, study, go to school, earn your stripes, get the best job you can do, prove yourself. And God says, hey, I'm at work. I love you. I'm pursuing you. But I got a better plan. And in that plan, I'm going to change you. And that process is going to be challenging. It's going to be challenging. God's invitation brings us to a decision that requires faith and action. You see, when we're focused on our reality, we don't have to do anything different. When we're focused on God's reality, he draws us back to this abiding relationship. Because the only way our perspective will ever change when we hear the voice of God call us into something, the only way that we will tune our frequency is if we spend time with God. God. If you spend time with God and you earnestly seek him, the word says that he'll reward you. You will experience him. He will reveal himself to you, his reality. But that's going to require faith, more faith, right? Not works faith, just more faith. God's invitation brings you to a decision that requires faith and action. It's an opportunity. You ever think of it that way? It's an opportunity to get to know God more intimately and experience all that he has for you. Because see, if you hit the Y in the road, like we talked about, and you go the other direction, you miss out on what God has purposed for your life. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. Faith. Faith expects confidence. This is what, it's having an inner conviction that things will come to pass if God purposes them. I want you to think about this for a minute. God is not calling you to some stupid blind faith. What God invites you into, he will equip you to do as you walk with him and trust him on his journey, right? It isn't this picture where we again come with our lives all figured out. But here's what I would say. If this isn't God's plan and you have faith in something other than God's plan, don't get discouraged if it doesn't come to fruition, right? It doesn't come to pass. Hebrews 11.6 says this, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Well, what, again, what's the reward? We get to experience the fullness of God when we trust him and walk with him. That's a reward that is worth way more than anything else this this earth could ever give us to truly experience God. God is looking for our faith, not our perfection. When we respond, we get to experience him. And I was thinking about 
not having perfect faith, not having our act all together. And I went right to in my mind, Luke chapter five. Some of you know the story. Early in Jesus' ministry, the picture is they're on the Sea of Galilee. Peter and, 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 uh, Peter and James, Peter and John have one of the fishing boats on the shore. There's two fishing boats. They're over here washing their nets, right? They're washing their nets. Jesus is preaching to the, cl- to the crowd, and then he walks over and he steps in Peter's boat, Simon. He says, hey, Simon. He says, push out to the middle of the lake. Cast your nets out. What does Simon say? You guys remember? His response is, okay, boss, if you think that's going to work, like literally a snarky response. If you look at it in the Greek, okay, boss, whatever you say, but we've been fishing. In other words, God, your plan's not going to work, but we've been fishing all night and we have caught zip, right? That's the story. That's what God is revealing that Jesus is doing. What happens? The nets fill up so much with fish that they got to call the other guys, the second boat out to bring the whole fish in. What does Peter do? Peter has an encounter with God. He drops to his knees and he says, Lord, get away from me. It's the same picture when you have an encounter with God, when God is at work and he invites you into something. You remember Isaiah chapter six? With the prophet Isaiah, he sees a picture in the heaven. He goes, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. Here's what I mean about experiencing God. When we trust God, when we step out, when we wrestle through our crisis of belief and we begin to experience the real God, not this legal, phony, fake it until you make it God, but the real God, we are provoked to change. We see ourselves for who we really are and then we see God for who he is. He is a gracious, merciful, kind God who cares and loves us so much that he invites us to join him on his mission, right? And it's this beautiful picture with Peter, not perfectly, but this sets the trajectory of Peter's life totally different, completely different than being a fisherman. They literally drop their nets to follow Jesus after this. Think of it. You want to talk about a quick vocational change? Crazy. Worship team, you guys can start working your way up. Our obedience to what God calls us to do is not always, we don't always have this perfect attitude, do we? Uh, Admit it, right? Okay, boss. Okay, God, whatever you say. We're dragging our bag of goods along with us. God's just saying, dude, trust me. Trust me. When we act in faith, we get to experience a rich relationship with God and what God wants to do. And I, thinking about Abraham First of all, Hebrews chapter 11 is just a phenomenal chapter in the Bible, but listen to what verses 8 through 10 say about faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Right? Isn't that crazy? Is that foolishness to the world? You're moving where? Because this God told you to move there? You're taking this job because God told you to take take this job? You're forgiving that person because God told you to forgive? What are you, crazy? Anybody hear those voices? You're not crazy. You're in a sweet spot to experience God, right? Right? Let's go on. By faith, verse 9, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac, Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Do you think... Abraham and Moses would have ever followed God if they knew what they had to walk through? You think Joseph Joseph would? Go down the list, David, go down the list. Peter, 
Paul. None of them would. But they responded to God's invitation. They worked through their crisis of belief time and again over. They wrestled spiritually with their flesh and the devil who speaks those lies into our ears. But they remained faithful. The writer of Hebrews says many of them never lived to see the final outcome, right? Yet they did it because they were looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Isn't that good? What is God leading you to that has created a crisis of belief in your life? Is there one that comes to mind? There probably is, right? Is it relational in nature? Is it vocational? Is it about a house? Is it about a move? It's unlimited. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to embrace God and trust Him? That's the question today for all of us, right? We're all in it. No, no one's arrived here. Will you take a step of trust and act on God's invitation? So last week we did this, we had this serve card on each of the seats. So many of you guys filled those out. If you've filled those out, don't fill out another one. But if you've had not had the opportunity and you've been praying and they're in the seat pockets in front of you, I would encourage you to step out in faith. Maybe it's something basic, just like serving in your church because God is at work here and he wants to use you to reach other people. There's all kinds of options that we have here. I would encourage you guys to take one of these, fill it out, drop it in a box. We will pursue you. We will find a place for you to serve. Our desire is that we walk together with God to accomplish his purposes and his plans. Remember, he's always at work, right? And he's inviting each of us into a relationship with him that's real and personal, right? And he's revealing his plan. He's inviting us to join him in his plan. And he's actually speaking through his word, his spirit, this body of believers, your life circumstances. God wants to walk you through whatever crisis you're in because he's a good God and he cares. He loves. Amen.